I want to start by telling you about something. I don't know how many know us about mikvah, and I know this is weird. I didn't know if I should start with it. Mikvah is the Bible's way of saying baptism. Mikvah is in the Old Testament. Um, let's say you had a Gentile. If you ever had a Gentile and they wanted to become a Jew, they had to go through mikvah. Mikvah was religious cleansing. It was the process in which you take them and they're washed of their impurity as being born a Gentile. And then they could become a Jew at that point because they had been washed. Mikvah is where we get our current concept of our covenant. Our new covenant is based on we are baptized into Christ. In Genesis chapter 17, there is a covenant, and it's the first covenant that required something from us. And I want you to notice that things are so odd with God. Have you ever thought about how strange baptism is? Because baptism is kind of strange. I mean, you have somebody plunge you underneath water so that you can be unified with God. Well, the first covenant is even more weird, and we're going to be honest with it. Genesis chapter 17. First covenant is even more weird, right? Because it's the covenant of circumcision. But what it is, is God comes in any covenant, no matter what covenant it is, and he comes and he says, this is what I offer you. There is something to gain. There is something that you will receive in this covenant. And the very first part of any covenant, no matter what it is, is God offering himself. So starting in verse 1, now when Abram was 99 years old, so he's a little bit older than most of us, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I'll multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, or exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham, father of multitude. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojourn, all the land of Canaan, for I, for an everlasting possession, I will be their God. So God always starts out with any covenant. We're going to start with this. He's always going to offer us something that we have to gain. First Timothy puts it this way, but godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Now let's look at this. Now Abram just received a covenant from God. He said, I'm going to do something great with you. Now how old was he? Nine, okay, is he, he's a little bit older than us, right? Now let me ask you something. How many of us are less than 99? See, okay, now we're getting. So when we talk about this covenant, we have to remember something. He is just starting this covenant at age 99. So next time you hear somebody say, I've served God at this point, I'm kind of sitting back. Think about Abraham just a second. 99, he's like, let's start that covenant of circumcision. Doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> Whew. But he does. He says, he starts off, he says, I will make of you not a nation. Notice that he does not say to Abraham, I will make of you the father of a nation. That is essential to us and it's important because it means that God has more of a plan than what we see in a lot of the Old Testament, where he's just working through Israel. How many of y'all ever noticed the book of Jonah? Jonah's an odd book in the Bible because in Jonah, guess what we realize? God is not just out for Israel. He actually cares about the enemy of Israel, Nineveh. But then, of course, with every covenant, God has offered us something. He's offered us hope. He's offered us contentment. He has offered us a reward in heaven. An escape from the justice that is required of us. But as in any covenant, there's always requirements. He demands all. Starting in verse 9. 
God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of a covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in your house or is bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendants. A servant who is born in your house or is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. He says something in here that we would almost walk at is that he says it's an everlasting covenant. How many of y'all know that circumcision will last till the end of time? Right, because we're, we're taught that circumcision is just fleshly. And the problem is, in the New Testament, we didn't remove circumcision. We kept circumcision in the New Testament. What we did was we said it is more important that we are circumcised inwardly. He describes it as those are not Jews who are those who are outwardly. But those who are Jews, who are those who are inwardly, who have the circumcision that is not in the flesh, but those who have a circumcised heart. The one who is, as our first commandment gives us, giving all to God. And you notice that he doesn't grant any exceptions. He says, if there's a slave in your house, he also needs to be circumcised. If there is anybody in your tribe that you have collected in any way physically possible, I demand all of it. Now, in this covenant, we have a very, it's a national covenant. Abram was the father of a nation. And it was a national covenant in which you had multiple people. And in our covenant, it is very personal. But no less is it true that he demands everything. He talks about it, and it's unusual for him to say something that would be like, well, you know, if you acquire somebody. They need to be circumcised. And why would he just, you know, go off and start on this little tangent about how, you know, make sure your slaves are circumcised? Because what he's doing is talking about any commandment, it's 100%. None of us would look at a marriage covenant and go, it's okay, you know, if there's a few things kept out. You know, on Friday nights, whatever you do, you do. Whatever stays in New York, lives in New York. What is that phrase? But you know what I'm saying? There's this concept where we've put God's covenant and made it so different. But what he says is everything, all in your life is required. And it all goes back to this. There's always two parts to a covenant. You break the second part, you don't get the first part. We talked about gain and then all. If we don't give 100% all to God, he is not able to give us that gain. God is perfect and holy and just, and that is bad for us. The fact that God is so perfect and so holy is actually bad for us because it means that when God looks at us, he doesn't see like we see. We're like, well, that's a pretty good person. Well, I don't, I don't see that much. But when God looks at us, he sees the inward self. He sees the darkness. He sees our inward struggle and knows that our flesh wants to serve something besides him, wants to serve ourselves, wants to serve those inward temptations. Do not say you're tempted by God, but we are tempted by our own fleshly desires. That's what God sees, is that darkness. And he says, without you giving me 100%, that gain is impossible. He says, if anybody chooses not to be circumcised, kick them outside the camp. It's not worth it. You're going to lose that gain. But we're going to see a very human reaction to this beautiful covenant in which God is offering hope. Starting in verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, 
Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, no. But Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at the season next year. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. What did he try to do? He tried to take God's covenant and do the natural human thing, didn't he? He said, let's try a little extra. You know, I, I know you say that, I'm, remember, he's 99 years old. Don't forget his age. This is very important. And, it, and God comes to him and says, your wife's going to have a kid. How many 99-year-olds are going to go, yeah, that, that makes sense. And the fact is, he is so overcome, he just starts laughing. He falls on the ground laughing. And he says, okay, I got an idea that actually might work, God. Why don't we take Ishmael and make him great, and then through Ishmael, everything will go good. Because remember, I'm 99, God. Don't forget that. And this is not reserved to him. This is reserved to all covenants we do. In a lot of covenants, there's these extras that we try to force into them. We, we try to make things different than the way God intended. The, the main covenant you'll hear talk about is the main covenant we deal with is marriage. Because that covenant is referred to that relationship as with God. And he says that we are the bride of Christ. And it's this covenant language we see again. And did you never notice that divorce doesn't exist in the Bible? Because if you listen to the phrase of Christ, you figure out divorce doesn't actually exist. It's very confusing. To commit adultery, somebody needs to be married, right? Makes sense, right? For you to commit adultery, you have to be married. Now, when Jesus talks about divorce, he says, if you divorce and then marry somebody, you just committed adultery because you are married. Now, he's not, you know, we're not going into depth about all the different applications of that. But what we are getting at is this. We want to take what he has said and make it different. For, for whatever reason, we want to take when he says something like that and go, oh God, that's not really what you mean. But when Christ talked about it, what did he do? He said, let's go back to the garden. Let's talk about how I set it up before you messed it up, before Moses let Israel do something because they were all hardened of heart. He says, let's go back to that and see what happened. Let's look at where God gives Adam Eve and where the two become one flesh in which God does the joining. And Jesus says, and how can a man separate what God has joined together? So in this same covenant that Abraham had, he went to the extra because he thought it was laughable. I mean, honestly, he falls on the ground laughing. But Paul speaks of this and he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. <clears throat> and too often it becomes that we say, Well, God, I mean, haven't you given us a lot of restrictions, a lot of rules? Isn't there a lot that you demand of us? And don't you expect some things that, to our mind, don't seem that possible? The fact that he's laughing tells us that Abraham views this as impossible. He doesn't see how a 90-year-old guy, 99-year-old guy is going to have a use. He's going to be serving God. He's got a function to serve God. Now, we can talk about how they lived longer back then. But uh, at this time, they're not living that long. Now, they're living longer than us, but not that much longer. He's lived the majority of his life at this point. Sarah has for sure lived in the majority of her life. She's going to die in a couple chapters. In a few years, 
Sarah's going to die. And in that, God wanted to do something with her before she died. How many of you have ever heard that a church with older people was dying? I think it's the stupidest phrase I've ever heard, actually. I do. I don't, I don't understand. It makes no sense. I, I raise a son, and the odds are my son will not live in West Virginia. Just going with the odds. It's a mobile society, right? He's going to move at some point. He'll get a job and go somewhere, hopefully. Hopefully he gets the job, you know. Going somewhere is optional. And you will hear it said that older people are a dying congregation. Now, here's my question for you. If God uses a 99-year-old man, can we rethink that a little bit and go, we got a bunch of really strong older people who are probably going to be here 20 years. You know what? My son may not be here in 20 years. He'll go off to college, maybe, or wherever he goes. And do you realize how we could rethink that and we can say, a congregation of older people is a congregation of Abram, a congregation of Sarah's, who if you've got six years left, you've got enough to start the covenant that lasted until we got it. Because after all this, verse 23, we see what Abram does. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all the servants who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's household, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the very same day as God had said to them. Now Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the very same day, Abraham was circumcised, and Ishmael his son, all the men of his household, who were born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. That is a challenge. And most of the sermons are geared towards middle age because I try to balance them. This one's not. I'm not even close to 99. I don't really think about dying that much. I don't think about do how many years do I have? But you know what? At this point, Abram is at the point where he's expecting to die at some point. He's considering his wife dried up. There's a good Hebrew term for you. Dried up. She is past childbearing. She can't have any kids. But after all that, he reasons with God and he struggles with God. And he says, what about Ishmael? Could he be? And he says, no, not Ishmael. And he goes, okay. And that very same day, he makes a point to say that twice. That day, he goes and does what God wanted. But one who looks intently at the perfect law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. This covenant is for all of us. You'll, you'll hear this term over and over, and it's really weird that we hate this term, but we call it an everlasting covenant, because it is. It's a covenant that allowed us to come in. Now, have things changed? Yes. Mikvah has become more important in circumcision. External circumcision has become less. And I started with mikvah because that's our point. We have a ritual cleansing. We have something where it's not about the water. It's about giving all and coming to God and in the purity of faith going, God, this one doesn't make any more sense than the last one. I mean, think about it. Circumcision doesn't make a lot of sense. Circumcised people are holy. Did you put that on your list of good people? Well, are you circumcised? That'll tell me if you're a good person. I, you know, Jesus is talking about things like helping the poor, loving your neighbor. And right now we're looking at circumcision. And in Christianity, we look at ritual cleansing, ritual cleansing, cleansing. Right? And it's all about trusting God that as strange as things seem and as different as it is, that God will take that same concept that he did with Abraham, where he did. He went and that same day he carries it out. And today we're still celebrating it. Today we 
are celebrating the fact that God offers us a cleansing that he spoke of in Isaiah. Clorox. I mean, I don't know about Clorox. All these detergents get you pretty clean. They do. But God has a reference in the Bible to in Isaiah. And it always reminds me of Clorox bleach. It makes it white. He says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they're red, they're dark, they're nasty, they will be as white as snow. Though they're red, like crimson red, they will be like wool. I don't know how many of y'all else got the Clorox view, but I did when I was reading this. Because it is. You ever spilt just a little bit of bleach on something? It's gone. If it's a red shirt, you're going to have white spots. Perfectly white spots. I know it happens, doesn't it? Most of us have done it. We've gotten bleach on something, and it took out all the color. And that's the image we get here. He says to them, though your sins are as scarlet, you're going to be white as snow. Offering a perfection that says, you know what? You can now come before me. This God who is so just and so holy that he has to be separated from us can then look at us and go, I don't see any color left. Nope, I don't see the red... I don't see that scarlet. I don't see that crimson. I see you washed white as snow, white as wool. And then a perfect holy God who cannot stand even a glimpse of evil. He has to cast it out, has to send it away, has to allow for it to go to everlasting suffering because he can't touch it because he is holy and perfect. That same God can then look at us in this cleansing that he offers us in Christ where he says, your sins are scarlet, but you're going to be so white that I can't tell the difference. That God is looking at it and going, I can't see anything wrong with that. And you have this beautiful picture of the covenant in the New Testament in which we start out blood red, And through blood, we are made whiter than snow. Tonight, if there is anyone who has not trusted God, even though, you know, it may seem crazy and it may seem different, just to trust God and let him see the great things that he did when someone actually trusts him. If there's anybody having heard the word, having believed that Jesus is Lord, having confessed him as Lord, Repenting of your sins, being buried in the waters of baptism, and raised to live for him. Or if there's anybody who needs prayers or wants to submit to the fellowship here, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing.